let me first confess that although we are in the same building or we were in the same building, I'm not a philosopher. My area is rather different, uh, economics or I would say political economy. Uh, Well, the title of my presentation is Equilibrium and Disequilibrium Dialectics of Equilibrium and Disequilibrium uh, kind of 150 years after Marx's capital. So let me first start with my own subject, one of the social sciences, but which is moving further away from social science to become a more or less a natural science, that's economics. Uh, in economics, John Maynard Keynes in 1935, in his general theory, informed us that economic theory up to him is basically an equilibrium economics. Meaning, if the things are disrupted, if the equilibrium is disrupted, that re-establishes equilibrium. In other words, the general condition of the capitalistic system is equilibrium. That's the sort of principal idea of capital, classical or neoclassical economic theory. But Keynes presented an idea which was very revolutionary at that time. <laughs> and very heterodox. He said, no, capitalism is not inherently equilibrium system, it is disequilibrium system. In other words, the general condition of the capitalistic system is not equilibrium but disequilibrium. So it's a very revolutionary and heterodox position uh, when we look at the, or when we compare with the classical, neoclassical, political theory, or economic theory. Uh, why we call, or why we see, or why we couldn't understand this disequilibrium character of the capitalist system. That is, if you go to a Peradeniya market or somewhere, you see things are moving smoothly, no disruptions, nothing serious is happening. So in your day-to-day -day understanding, we think things are moving smoothly, disruptions are not very frequent, Irregularities are less, so therefore, system is in equilibrium. That is how classical and neoclassical, that conclusion that capitalist system is equilibrium system. In other words, I call it micro-sizing macro. You based from your individual microscopic situations and extended that to the macro analysis, thus you come with the micro in equilibrium. Keynes began with in a macro. When you look at macro, I mean this I can do this sometime back, a friend of mine who went to an economist, who went to Spain, and Spain is in kind of a sick person, person in the system. 
25% are unemployed. This is about even before this Catalonian incident. So I asked my friend, how is Spain? Is it in a kind of a crisis? He said, no, things are happening as it is. No major disruption, not even strikes or anything. So seemingly it's an equilibrium system. So what Keynes said was, he looked at those macro situations and said capitalism is always or inherently a disequilibrium system. I started with this uh, from economics, but this is almost similar to other social sciences. If you go to political science or even geography, it's something like that. System is basically in equilibrium, that was the kind of idea. But Keynes' idea was not taken well by the fellow economist because he was not able or he did not founded his macro theory on micro foundation. So that was the whole problem with Keynesian analysis. Even though people like John Robinson, Pierre Straffa, said economic theory. That advice seriously, because he was much more important, he was much more concerned about the uh, situation at that time to come out of the crisis in the capitalistic system. So this brings us, Marx, it was 150 years ago, his first volume of Capital published in German, Das Capital. I think Desmond started that discussion. I will sort of extend what he said. So Marx developed a theory which combine microanalysis with macroanalysis. Micro and macro combination. But it's a different kind of micro. It's not the micro of market. It's not the micro of neoclassical theory. It's a different kind of micro. So let me start with that a little bit. Uh, In kind of theories, their main focus is on things, events, structures, like that.
that is also is correct when he said that actually Marxism is not an extension of Hegelian system, but for different reasons. I'll come to that. So when it comes to the analysis, now, now the question is ontology or epistemology? As uh, Shant, you can't have an ontology without epistemology. I may disagree. What is ontology? Well, number of definitions were given. In simple language, ontology is a theory of being, epistemology of theory of knowledge. How we now, when it comes to Marxism, I think one of the most important thing Marx has made is the distinction between false or empty abstraction and real abstraction. What does it mean? To understand that, let me quote another quotation from Marx, this time by Grundrisse, page 100 and 101. I'll quote, in precondition, unquote, then other quotation. However, this is very important. On close examination, this proves false. It would be a chaotic conception of the whole, and I would then, by means of further determination, move analytically towards ever more simple concepts from the imaging concrete towards ever thinner abstraction until I had arrived at the simplest determination. I will explain a little bit. Marx first talk about what other social scientists in, uh, in his time and prior to that did. They started analysis with the whole, with the macro, like population, like income, uh, G GDP, like that, and started to move from that to markets, prices, and things like that. So in other words, they move further downwards. Marx said that system is wrong. That is not what we should do. That should, that should not be our epistemology. I'll come to the ontology later. Epistemologically, what we should do is not to start with population because it is a very chaotic conception. Very concrete, but very chaotic. So he said, we must move from this concrete chaotic conception to more simple and thinner abstractions. And he comes to the simple and thinner abstraction as Desmond said, to commodity. So if you read Capital Volume 1, it begins with, I don't remember exactly, but it says, the, capital, the, the capitalist system is a system of, generalized system of commodity production. So the commodity, he abstracted from, general, that concrete chaotic conception. <laughs> so this is how we should explain or we should distinguish what is what I call false abstraction and simple abstraction. Uh, false and empty abstraction and real abstraction. Because in many situations, most of the Marxists use Marxism as a some kind of some kind of well, epistemology, but some kind of schema, like this. In Marxism, very, very simple Marxism, we say there is a thesis, then you have antithesis, then the contradiction, and it moves to synthesis. That has nothing to do with Marx. In other words, 
you can use just using Marxian categories, you can develop the Marxian dialectical system. That is what Marx said. I think if you read most of the history books written by some of the Marxists, you can see they are very, very, they are based on this kind of false and empty abstraction. So he said, we should go for a real abstraction. So that is why he said, we have to go for a simplest determination. So he comes to the commodity to begin. Then he said, from there, that is from commodity, the journey would have to be retraced until I had finally arrived at the population again. So he does not stop at the commodity. That's the simplest abstraction. But it's a real abstraction. I'll say why it is real abstraction. Then he started moving again back to the population. But then you come to a population not as a chaotic conception, but as a rich totality of many determinations and relations. The concrete is concrete because it is the concentration of many determinations. Hence, unity of the opposite. I think this is the best quotation as far as I know from Marx if you really want to understand the Marxian dialectical system. But when we come to that epistemology, Marx O Engels, especially Engels, say that nature, society is dialectical. It is not in our mind. This dialectics is not in our mind, not in our categories. We are not going to see thesis, synthesis. But what we are trying to do is the real situation, objective situation. Here, I think Nalin made a, quite a good remarks on this in his writings also. What is real? Real has four elements, or rather four features. First is objectivity. Objectivity means what can be known, what is known, what can be known, but is still even not known. Second is fallibility. That is, the knowledge can be fallible when new information emerge. The third is transphenomenality. What does it mean? It means the truth or the real reality is not just what we can see or what we can feel, what we can see, what we can feel, or what we can hear. It moves. D. That's why Roy Baska said that ontology is in, it's a depth ontology. So we have not only horizontally, but we have to move. That is why he said not only, not only induction and deduction, but we need retroduction. That is why uh, this trans phenomenality. And the, third, the fourth item is counter phenomenality. Reality is counter phenomenal. Now, for example, we all say, and we all believe, or not believe, we all say, and it's common sense. Sun rises. And sun sets. I mean, our language has given this. But it is not true. That's why it's counter phenomenon. So we have to look at the, this totality. That's the reality. That's the, I think that's the word I think I use, not materialism, not Marxian materialism, Marxian realism. So this totality is not, is ontologically dialectical. That's the, that is Marx's point, or that's especially Hegel's uh, dialectics of nature or anti uh, if you read, that's what we can see. The nature, the, the, the reality is, reality with these four elements is 
ontological. So, episteme is to understand this ontological character, to, 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 to see this ontological character, to see these things. So, therefore, Marxism is ontological basically. But to understand that ontology and to structure that and also to present that, you need epistemology. So I think basically Marxism is that. So when it comes to Marxian capital, let me finish how we proceed. So if you read volume one of Capital, it is based on an assumption that capital is uh, capital is total. No division, no differentiation. But in reality, capital is differentiated, but no differentiation. So he assumed that everything was done in one big single monopoly factory. And that is how we explain capital labor relationship in Capital Volume 1. So it's a, that's the level of abstraction. In the second volume, he concretizes it by adding, by extending, or by including. Capital Volume 1 is just on production. But in Capital Volume 2, introduce circulation. So further concretization. He started with commodity and moved to money and to the production and capital accumulation. And then in the second volume, move to second uh, accumulation. So it's a very boring writing. And normally people don't read second volume. They read first, then go to third. No harm, but to understand Marx's sixth volume too. Then come to the third volume in which he introduced differentiation of capital or capitalist competition different mode of capital, finance capital, banking capital, usurious capital, and many, many forms of capital. And he wanted to start world trade and things in the next volumes, but he was not able to finish his project. So, to, I would say Marxism is basically an ontological what he tried to understand is the ontological reality with its four elements using bus. When you understand that and when you systematize your knowledge, then you need how to how to proceed things like that. And that if you do not understand Marxism uh, the capitalist system ontologically, then what you are going to do is you just use schema to understand that then you will not find real capitalistic system. So with that note,